Hey guys, Dave Keller here with Market Misbehavior. I've had the market certainly uh, in distribution mode in recent weeks and it really sort of culminated in today's 2 plus percent drop with the S&P down 2 percent, the Nasdaq down more like 3 percent here on, uh, on Tuesday. And so it's led to a lot of questions in terms of the breadth characteristics, I think because the breadth picture has been deteriorating. We've actually talked on this channel about the breadth deterioration for, for quite a while. In a recent video, I talked about how the uh, cumulative advanced decline lines have been rolling over and they peaked out in July, or excuse me, June, and then since then have been coming uh, lower. I had some questions about the equal weighted nature of the advanced decline line and how to make sense of that. How do you really relate the movements in the AD line versus the movements in price? What we're gonna do today is look at the, some of the historical market tops, look at some of the advanced decline indicators, see what they told us about the conditions then and then what they're telling us about the conditions now, so today it's all about the cumulative advanced decline lines. So I always tell people that market breadth is such an important part of the macro perspective uh, for a technical analyst. And for me, it's in priority order, price first, then breadth, then sentiment. Your number one goal should be understand the price. What does the price tell you about the supply and demand picture, the fear and the greed, the emotional state of investors and what they're doing with their capital? Breadth is secondary to that because when you see a broad index doing a certain thing, breadth indicators tell you about the companies that make up those indexes. And a lot of times, the breadth indications will actually turn before the market itself turns. And that just goes, uh, just uh, speaks to how investors tend to get defensive toward the end of the move. That allows the, uh, the market to continue higher at the end of a bull run, uh, while a lot of individual stocks are already uh, breaking down. We've arguably been seeing that in the last couple of months here in, uh, in mid-2021. Before we get to the charts of the advanced decline lines, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how they're equal weighted and what that means. I just want to remind you, if this sort of thinking about technical analysis, behavioral finance, price, spread, sentiment, trend, momentum, all of the above, if that's of interest to you, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. It'd be awesome to have you along this ride with us. Also, give the video a thumbs up if you appreciate it. We would very much appreciate that back. Finally, put a comment below. Do you think the breadth conditions are enough to push the S&P even further? And where do you see the S&P finding a bottom here in 2021? Let's get to the charts. So this chart that we're looking at is the S&P 500 at the top, just a closing uh, value. And you see the 50 and 200 day moving averages on there. Below there, I have the cumulative advanced decline lines and I have it on four different groups of stocks. The New York Stock Exchange, common stock only. So that eliminates closed end funds, stuff like that. So it's really trying to focus on the, on the common stocks listed on the NYSE. And then I have a line for large caps, mid caps and small caps. So it's looking at the breadth in each of those different cap tiers. And this is a chart I have on stockcharts.com as part of my, uh, what's called the Mindful Investor Live Chart List. This is a list of charts that I maintain and keep maintained uh, every week. And I refer to them every day, multiple times a day, often just trying to understand the market dynamics. What I wanted to do though, is show you what this chart kind of looked like at some of the previous tops. So look last year, 2020, we'll look at the 2007 market peak and also the 2000 market peak. And you'll see some of the conditions and, uh, and what they meant. <clears throat> Before we get to the current chart, let's actually go all the way back to 2000. Now, we're a little limited in terms of the data because we don't have some of the advanced decline line data, but I did put together a New York Stock Exchange AD line and an S&P 500 AD line. Now, what you can see here, the 2000 top was actually very unique. While we talk a lot about breadth divergences, we talk about a lot of conditions. And you know, when I, when I think of a checklist for classic market tops, the 2000 top certainly doesn't um, play uh, play to that. And, and I'll tell you why. The breadth conditions going into 2000 were negative for quite a while. The breadth measures actually topped out in 1999 and were trending downwards for about a year, a year plus, before the market eventually topped out. Here's the March 2000 market peak. If you remember, if you were investing at that time, what you'll remember is we had a big move. We retested those highs again in July and in August. And then that's when the downtrend really started. So the tech bubble had technically popped, but the price really didn't recognize that change of character. It's so really the fourth quarter of 2000. That's when things really started to roll over. If you look, the advanced decline lines had actually been in a steady downtrend. So what happened is at the end of the phase, you had a lot of stocks were already starting to fail. A lot of stocks that were actually trading lower while the, uh, the markets were still going higher. Now, as I'm describing this, let's just review. Um, I, I have a video that I'll post a link to uh, below uh, that I talked about breadth indicators, particularly the advanced decline in a lot more detail. 
Uh, but just to be clear, uh, the advanced decline line is basically looking every day how many stocks are closing higher on the day, how many stocks are closing lower on the day. So at the end of the day, you have a daily advancers decliners number, and it's a net value number of advancers minus the number of decliners. Now, that's a very simple measure. We'll get to that in a little bit. But you can string those daily changes together over time, and you get what's called a cumulative advanced decline line. Then you can start to look at the trends in advancers decliners and compare that to the trends that you're seeing in price. So just like you could look at one day's trading and look at the current day's advancers de decliners number, it doesn't really tell you about the long-term trend. And, and, and overall, I think it's much more important, certainly for long-term investors, to understand the trend in the, uh, in the price and also a trend in the breadth characteristics. So the cumulative advanced decline line allows you to do that. If that didn't make sense, check out the video that I that I linked to below. Hopefully it fills in some of the details for you. So the 2000 market top, the breadth was actually negative for quite some time before the market top. Let's fast forward to 2007 and you can see it was actually a fairly, uh, fairly straightforward uh, divergence. So here you have June and July of 2007. Now the S&P eventually topped out here in October but the small cap index and everything had already topped up a lot of uh, topped out a lot of stocks had already rolled over and you'll notice when the S&P made a new high there in October that all four advanced decline lines actually made a much lower high so none of them confirmed that high going into uh, September into October but if you look just at June and July you can see the S&P made a higher high over about a 6 week period but you can see that all four of these advanced decline lines actually made a lower high that is a classic pattern at a market top where you have the market going higher and it's not confirmed by the advanced decline uh, the advanced decline line so in 2000 it was actually very much a drawn out process you had you know months and months where the S&P continued higher and the 80 lines were trending downward so it was a broad divergence that took up quite a bit of time here in 2007, it was a much more narrow sort of uh, sort of pattern. This was the real negative uh, signal from breadth was in June and July. I sort of told you the top was in. So when there was a secondary top in October that eclipsed the previous highs, but on much lower uh, much lower reading from the advanced decline line, showed you how many stocks were really still in a in a downtrend. In the end, of course, we had 2008, 2009, the financial crisis that accelerated soon after that chart. Now, last year, we have the 2020 high. This is a classic breadth divergence. And this was interesting because large caps actually did a very different thing than the rest of the other cap tiers. Here's the January and February uh, highs in the S&P in a closing basis. I stopped the clock right after it started accelerating. And then you have the you know downtrend for another couple of weeks going into the March 2020 low. Look at how January, February, the S&P advanced decline line actually made a higher high. So in the previous uh, examples, the large caps actually were making a lower high along with all the other cap tiers. Here you actually have large caps making a higher high. So it shows you that large caps are actually still in an uptrend, broadly speaking. All the other ones, none of them confirm that February high though. Uh, the NYSE common stock only made a lower one. The mid cap index just barely undercut it, but it was really more flat. And the uh, small cap especially was in a uh, in a negative diversion. So the other cap tiers all, all actually showed stronger price in the S&P, but lower trend or lower highs in the uh, advancers decliners line. Finally, we have the current S&P and we're recording this sort of late September. The S&P has come off quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, but uh, today certainly down pretty significantly. We're testing the lows from uh, from uh, last week and also testing the lows from uh, from August for sure. If you look June into July, look at the higher highs in the S&P, the higher highs in the large cap advanced decline line, the lower peaks in the NYSE and the mid caps and in the small cap advanced decline line. So the other four are all actually giving a, uh, a bearish divergence while the price is going higher. So it looks a lot like the 2020 market top. What is different is that the S&P has actually continued higher for number, another six to eight weeks. After that divergence, you've seen the price going higher and higher. From here though, you can see that the S&P has once again made a new high August into September. And similar to what we saw in 2007, where the index made one more push higher, but it wasn't confirmed by the advanced decline lines. You have a lower peak from the NYSE line, a lower peak in the mid cap line, a lower peak in the small cap line. You do actually have a higher peak in the large cap AD line. So when we talk about how the market has continued to push higher, we talk about a rotation into growth, a rotation into mega cap technology, consumer names, and all of that. The, the strength in those mega cap names is what allows the advanced decline line for the large cap index to continue to go higher while all the other ones 
are uh, are going downward. So by looking at this previous uh, these previous market peaks, 2000, 2007, 2020, 2021, if this is indeed a market peak, you can see that not, none of these are exactly the same, right? Markets tend to top in certain different ways, and and that that is absolutely true, right? The conditions in you know mid 2000 versus mid 2007 versus early 2020 and today are all a little bit different but there were some consistent uh, patterns and particularly divergence from at least some of the breadth lines particularly the nyse line the reason why that's so important is because it's a broad universe not just a mega cap which a lot of times can be the defensive stocks but some of the other ones now let's get to today's question that really fueled this video which was what about the equal weighted nature of it, right? So when we're looking at the advanced decline line here for the mid cap index, that's looking at all the mid cap stocks. And it's basically saying how many of them closed up, how many of them closed down, but it doesn't include the percent change, right? If all of those stocks closed up 0.1%, or if all of those uh, stocks that advanced advanced 12%, shouldn't that be a much different reading? And the answer is maybe, right? I get the I get the argument, right? I mean, you're, you're, the, the thinking is, shouldn't it respect some of the percent changes, right? And if it's a bigger move, shouldn't that register as a bigger move? Here's why you don't do that with the advancers decline line. So number one, it's equal weighted, which means all 500 stocks in the S&P or all 600 stocks in the uh, small cap index are all treated the same. So each stock, Amazon is weighted the same as Peloton or whatever stocks are in those universes that we're talking about. And that's on purpose because the indexes themselves already have a cap weight bias to them, right? The S&P 500 is always driven by the biggest mega cap stocks. So you don't need a breadth indicator that's also, you know, um, you know, um, overweight the mega cap names because you already see that in the form of the index itself. The index itself is going to move primarily because of the move of those mega cap stocks. The benefit of doing it on an equal weighted basis is because it takes that mega cap overweight out of the picture. It weights all X number of stocks the same. As a result, it's going to respect the fact that a lot of the smaller names are going to rotate lower. That's why it's going to be reflected on the breadth lines before a lot of times on the indexes themselves. What about the percent changes that it's not including? It's actually the same reason. If you look at the index, if you look at a chart of the S&P or the NASDAQ 100 or the S&P mid cap, the S&P small cap, the Russell 2000 indexes, they already include the percent changes in, in the index movement themselves, right? So if the S&P, if the, if the stocks that make up the S&P all go up 1% or they all go up 12%, the index itself is going to move a degree, much, a degree much higher if the percentages are much bigger. So the index already shows you the percent changes that are involved. By simplifying the AD lines and just saying thumbs up, did it close higher or thumbs down, did it close lower? You're stripping out the impact of the percent changes and you're stripping out the impact of the mega cap stocks, the two things that the indexes themselves tend to overweight. So by stripping those two things out and focusing on just the individual names, equal weighting them all, and just very simply saying, are they going up or down? That's where you get to start to get a directional relationship from the, uh, from the index itself moving and from the AD lines in the direction that they're moving as well. So that's it. That is a breakdown of the AD lines, the advanced decline lines, particularly the cumulative advanced decline lines at four major market tops, the 2000 market top, the 2007 market top, the 2020 market top, and the very young, potentially 2021 market top. By illustrating this, I'm trying to show you how the conditions for each of those market tops are a little different, but certainly there are some similarities, particularly the bearish divergences that you tend to see at or near the market top. We've seen some of those conditions in 2021, similar to what we've seen at some of those previous bull market uh, bull market tops, but they're not all the same, right? There's some nuances and some differences, and that is the reality. There are also differences in terms of interest rates and inflation and gold and all these other asset classes. So no two tops are identical, but we can start to find some similarities. We also talked about why those uh, breadth indicators are equal weighted and why they don't include percent changes. It's really to simplify the relationship and those uh, those uh, factors, the percent changes and the mega cap or the, the, the cap weightings are already included in the price itself. So by stripping those out, we can do a, a much pure, more pure analysis of price versus breadth. If this sort of thinking about technical analysis, behavioral finance, price, breadth, sentiment, trend, momentum, all of those things is of interest to you, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. It'd be awesome to have you along this ride with us. Also, give the video a like if you appreciated it. We would very much appreciate that back. 
finally, put a comment below the video. What do you think about the breadth, breadth conditions about the S&P 500 right now? Do you see the market going lower and where do you see it heading to? Let me know in the comments below. For everyone at Market Misbehavior, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon.